Hi everyone, welcome back to another Grace Church online service. So glad that you're tuning in again. And I wanna to talk to you from my heart for a few minutes before we move into the service that we've recorded and planned. Uh, one of the downsides of uh, recording a service and putting it together and then posting it is that we, we lose the real time interaction. And um, uh, t today, Jessica and I spent the day with my mom and my sister and our girls, we had a great day. But when we came home, we heard about the rioting and the protesting and the looting and the fires and all that's happening in LA and around our country. And we've been watching it for hours tonight. And if we were in a regular church service where we were all together, I could call an audible and go a different direction and talk about those things. And we don't really have that option in a recorded service like we're doing. So I wanted to at least insert a few thoughts here on the front end. So we are going to run the worship set that we've planned. And I have another emotionally healthy relationships message that we'll post here in a minute. Um, but I, I want to talk from my heart for a second, and, and, I, and I want us to pray. Uh, today's Pentecost Sunday. Uh, that's uh, seven weeks after Easter, we have Pentecost. And Pentecost Sunday is viewed as the birthday of the church. Um, we read about it in Acts chapter 2. That was the moment when the Holy Spirit, when God was poured out on the early church and those early disciples were filled with the Spirit of God and then they went out and changed the world. And so on Pentecost Sunday, we need to pray for our world. We need the Spirit of God like never before. So we'll pray a little bit later in the morning too when we do our Praying 210 segment. But um, I'll pray here in just a second for LA and for the whole country. Um, but I just want to just talk for uh, just, just real quickly because we we watch moments like this in our history and and if and I know you're like me that we agree that the outrage and the uproar is good. It is so good that our world is pushing back and saying we have had enough of racism and we've had enough injustice. It's good. In fact, I I posted a, a video on my Instagram feed a couple days ago about that. That that I, I'm hoping that this pushback is a sign that the conscience of our country is just saying we, we've had enough of these issues. Obviously, when a pushback and a protest turns violent, it becomes self-defeating. And obviously, when 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 our, our quest for justice and a cry for for um, for being heard when, when it when it turns destructive, well, then it creates a whole other dynamic. And what we're hoping for and what we need is is justice without anarchy. And, and so we just need to pray. And, and I want to share a couple of thoughts because sometimes we can watch this and wonder, what do we do? And, and what's our role? And I want to remind you that, that we who profess Christianity, we who are following Jesus, we have the answer. Now, how we share the answer and communicate the answer is a different discussion, but we have the answer. I want to read my favorite scripture verse to you. Um, I always have a, a new favorite scripture, and my new favorite scripture right now is in John chapter 19, verse 5, where Pontius Pilate has uh, examined Jesus. He's presented him to the people. Pilate can't find any fault in Jesus, but the people are demanding his, his crucifixion anyway. And Jesus, or Pilate, presents Jesus, and he says, Behold the man. And that phrase, behold the man, has just been gripping me lately. Jesus is the man. Jesus is the picture of what humanity was supposed to be. And he's the picture of the humanity that God wants to bring about in the world. Jesus is not just the, the answer in the sense that he saves us from our sins. And of course, that's part of the message. And it's a beautiful, brilliant piece of the message. Jesus is the man and the savior in the sense that he's the blueprint. He's the pattern. Jesus is the pattern for a flourishing life. He's the pattern of how to build a, a family or a relationship or a government in a way that lasts and endures and is righteous. Jesus is the man. And it's so awesome because when you behold the man, you also end up beholding the God. Jesus presents humanity as we were supposed to be, and he also presents God as God is. If you ever want to know what God is like, you look into the face of the man, Jesus, um, because Jesus 
put a face on God for us. And so the longer you look at the man, the more you begin to see the God who has and is the answer for our world. And I just think that in light of all of the the, the, the protests and the, the uproar that's happening today around issues with race, I think it's pretty beautiful that right after Pontius Pilate presented the man, Jesus, a Jew, was forced to carry his own cross, his own execution device, but he was so exhausted from the beatings and the flogging and all that he went through, he couldn't do it. So do you remember who they roped in to help? They, they grabbed a bystander, a man named Simon from Cyrene. And Cyrene was in Africa. And so most people think that Simon of Cyrene was an African, a black man, who was asked to help a Jewish man carry his cross. And so at this moment of utter exhaustion and brokenness from Jesus, we see two representatives of the two races that have probably undergone the most persecution of any other races in the planet. And you see the two of them serving humanity. At the essence of the gospel is an inclusion and an embrace and a desire for the beauty and the brilliance of every ethnicity. That's the absolute pulse and heartbeat of the gospel. And we who serve that gospel must embrace it and live it and promote it to the best of our ability in our spheres of influence. And so um, I know sometimes we look around and think, well, what can I do? We follow Jesus. We behold the man. We live his character. We live his nature. And we pray. We ask the Holy Spirit to visit our world. And so would you do that with me right now? It's about 1130 and um, I'll check and see what's happening here when we're done, but let, let's pray. Holy Spirit, visit our world. Holy Spirit, would you fall upon LA County and spread all across our country and around our world and bring Pentecost. Would you breathe Pentecost into our broken, weary, divided souls? Holy Spirit, we need that flame and that passion from heaven to set our hearts ablaze with righteousness and justice and holiness and virtue. Bring a renewed humanity into the world today. God, protect people, people that are trying to do the right thing, but they're carrying it too far. People who are, are so broken and they're, they're acting out because they've never been heard. Lord, protect protesters, protect police officers. Um, protect hurting families, and don't let our country splinter. Don't let our country fracture even further. Instead, would you uproot the roots of racism from our foundations, uproot these sins, have your way in our country, and God, visit us and help us who are trying to follow you to do a better job of presenting the man and witnessing for the God and revealing and releasing what that means to the world. So Jesus, we just need you today. We want you to wash us clean. We want you to forgive us. We want you to empower us and touch our world. So Lord, as we move into a time of worship now and teaching and ministering to our kids and giving and all the things that we do in our gatherings, be close and wrap us in your arms and touch our world and let your kingdom come. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. For this day. Good 
news today.
Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for another Grace Church online service. Thank you for worshiping with us. I so appreciate you tuning in and, and participating with us um, in these services. And if you're new to Grace, if you've just discovered us through these um, online services, check out our website, gracechurchlaverne.org. It'll tell you a little bit of our history and a little bit more of our, our ethos and passion and what we're all about. And hopefully at some point we could meet um, and get to know each other. But um, we always do something in our services called Praying 210, where we pray for our 210 corridor. That's our little piece of, of uh, influence here in Southern California. But before I, I pray for the 210, I wanna give you a quick update of the philosophy and the questions that we're processing and answering and asking as we consider the reopening of our in-person worship services. Um, when the president uh, said that churches should be elevated to the status of essential services. And then when we heard that houses of worship could reopen, that understandably raised a lot of questions of, hey, what does this mean? Are we back together next week? And just want to process that with you a little bit and, and tell you how we're answering that question. Because there's, there's three considerations, probably more, but three main considerations. Um, one is who will be with us when we reopen? And, and I don't mean who's still in our church, I mean who will feel comfortable, safe, and ready to re-engage at that level? Because some people won't because of health conditions or maybe age or, or they may want a little more time. So in order for us to go back to business as usual, which it will never be business as usual, we wanna get better and better, but to go back to that, that would assume that our full force of volunteers are ready and everyone's back in place. And so we need to find out if that's the case. I know there are people right now that they're ready to have some in-person meetings. They're ready for a small group. They're ready for a mid-sized group, but maybe they're not ready to be sitting in a, a worship service yet. And so we're going to be sending out a poll this week with a number of questions. Please respond to the poll. I want a high percentage of responses. It will really help us. It will let us know what your comfort level, what your perspective is, and, and how we can serve and help. And so that's the first thing is, is who will be there. Number two is what will the content of those gatherings be like? Um, it's wonderful that they're saying that we can gather again, but um, will wearing masks with them discouraging singing and social distancing and maybe staggering um, participation in services, maybe maybe minimized children's ministry services. Will that be better than, will that be a more um, uh, meaningful experience than what we have right now online and maybe through smaller gatherings? And, and maybe it will, maybe it won't. Those are questions that we need to wrestle with and process. And then the third thing we're considering is what's best for the larger community around us. For years now, we've been saying that we are for the city and we love this community and we pray for them every week. And so we're, all, we're weighing how much we want to see each other with what's also best for our community. And believe me, I know there are such strong opinions all over the map right now about um, how we process this and how big of a threat is it, how, uh, you know, all of that stuff. And regardless of where anybody lands in the perspective, the, the opinion, um, we want to filter this through the grid of what's best for the community around us. How can we be for each other for the city safe honor god wise not overreactive not too um blase all of those things so um i know we're wanting a, a date i don't have a specific date I, I don't think this will be many many weeks down the road but but we need a little more time to hear from you and to really make the wisest decision possible plus remember in our situation we meet on a school campus and so i can't even decide next sunday i'll see you all back on our campus because we are also at the mercy of whether the school will allow us access. And so hang in there with me, um, stay close, stay in communication. And let me just remind you something, um, the, the church never closed. And I know you're hearing this from a lot of sources, but it's worth remembering. I, I almost don't like this idea of reopening church because um, the, the, the church has continued in different settings. And oh my goodness, the church is amazing. The church all throughout history has had lots of critics, and we've deserved a lot of those critics, but we have had no rivals. The church has lots of critics, but no rivals. There is no institution on the planet that has served humanity like the church. You can't go anywhere in the world practically where the church hasn't gone to build a hospital or start a school or serve hurting people in some way. So, so yes, we're a, we're a broken vessel with a lot of issues, but we are holding on to uh, the, this entry point and teaching of Jesus. And it's absolutely brilliant. And we need to be the church more than ever in our history. 
There is an endless wave of crisis and racism and tragedy that keep just smashing into our world. The church has not gone away. Yes, we'll be worshiping together very soon. But in the meantime, um, let's raise the vision of who we are and who we're called to. We are part of the serving, healing, transforming arm of God in the world. And so let's pray together for a minute for our 210 corridor. And let me take this thought and just kind of spread it around our world through prayer. So Jesus Christ, in your beautiful, powerful, holy, amazing name, thank you for calling us into your church family. Thank you for all the good that's been done all around the world, all through church history, through the church. And Lord, I want to just also retroactively say, would you forgive us for the bad that's been done? Forgive us for the excesses and the times when we got too political and too too power hungry or greedy and we didn't represent you well. Dear God, forgive us and let us live more and more and more in the true essence of what it means to be the beautiful, life-giving church of Jesus Christ. God, starting in this 210 corridor, from the youngest baby to the oldest senior citizen in Laverne, and then all up and down these towns of Upland and Rancho and Claremont and San Dimas and Ontario and Pomona and Montclair and Azusa and all around us, stretching all through Southern California, California, our, our country and our planet. Would you, Jesus, let your kingdom come and your will be done and let your agenda be served? Would you crush and overthrow racism, violence, assault, child abuse, uh, relational breakdowns, greed, all of the things that bring out the worst and the most damaged parts of our human nature. And God, bring life, bring holiness, bring grace, bring healing, bring an awareness of uh, your, your reality and touch people. Lord, bless every person who's joining us here today online. Would you fill them, meet them, and have your way in their lives. But God, we love you. We worship you. Amen. Hi, families. I am so glad you have decided to join us again online. Today, we are continuing our series on emotionally healthy relationships. And our topic, family. Now, for many of us, our families have played or continue to play a very important role in our lives. And our family relationships are some of the strongest bonds we have. And sometimes, when, even if they're really healthy, if change comes in our lives and we try to go and communicate that to our families, they don't really receive it well. And it's one of the hardest places for us to change and for our families to accept us changing. And so I wonder if some of you have ever experienced a change in your life and when you try to go home to your family and communicate that, it's not received well. And now this could be things like, maybe we decided we wanna change how we dress, or maybe we wanna change the nickname in which people call us, or maybe we decide we wanna hang out with these friends instead of those friends, or we like this hobby better or this sport better, and it's different than what our family's used to. Sometimes our family doesn't understand that. They might think we're weird. They might question it. They might even make fun of us a little bit. And it really isn't a fun thing to experience. So if you've experienced that, I want to tell you you're not alone. And I'm not just talking about me experiencing that as well. Jesus also experienced that. And so today I want to look at that story where when Jesus started his ministry, his family thought he was out of his mind. Can you believe that? They thought he was crazy. So let me read this verse to you. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. Now think about this. For his family, this might make sense. Jesus quit his job and decided to become a traveling preacher. So he doesn't necessarily have guaranteed income, doesn't really have a place to live. And how is he ever gonna, you know, get married and have a family. Older kids probably have heard that story from their parents before. The religious leaders don't like Jesus. In fact, they want to harm Jesus. And Jesus doesn't seem to care. So his family's really concerned for his health and well-being and they're trying to get him to stop and bring him home for his own safety. His family was a little bit afraid that the attention and fame was getting to his head because he was from a little town in the middle of nowhere, was a no-name nothing, 
And all of a sudden he has these large crowds following him. He was breaking the Sabbath, which is really against Jewish religion, Jewish code. And in fact, Jesus was so busy being with people that he often didn't even have time to eat. Okay, I can see why his family might think he's a little crazy. Now, Jesus was also showing spiritual power and ministry that he may have never shown before. I mean, he was healing people and he was casting out demons. That's not a light, fluffy, cotton candy type of thing to do. That is serious, intense stuff. Jesus also picked a group of very unlikely friends. The disciples, you've heard of them? And people question him for doing that. Why is he hanging out with these fishermen and tax collectors? They're kind of like, eh. So it really makes sense to me that Jesus' family would try to get Jesus away from the crowd and say, no, no, he's crazy, ignore him. They're trying to protect him. But they're also, in doing that, they're not accepting that Jesus is who Jesus is. And I think when we read this story, we can easily say, family, what are you thinking? And it's easy for us to kind of like cast judgment and say, family, you're the crazy one, it's not Jesus. But think about this. Jesus was called by God to do God's ministry. And Jesus chose the disciples he chose and look at the work they did to where we are still doing the work of Jesus thousands of years later. Jesus was acting in faith and obedience to our Creator God. Even when his own family called him crazy, which I bet it was hard for him, he didn't give up. He didn't give up on his calling. Think about it. His own family called him crazy. Those who he grew up with and spent most of his time with, most of his meals with, he probably played with them, confided in them, and they said he was out of his mind. But this did not stop Jesus. He knew what he was supposed to do. He knew it was right and he knew his calling. And to me, that's pretty awesome. I also find it really encouraging. So I want to encourage you, even if you're the only one, the odd one out, the weird one, the crazy one, or you feel like your family doesn't get you, you're not alone. And if you feel you are truly living out God's calling in your life, stick with it. Don't listen to anyone who may call you crazy. And as you do, may God bless you and protect you. May God show you favor and be gracious to you. May God show you kindness and grant you peace. Amen. All right, well, let's move back into our Emotionally Healthy Relationships series. So how are you doing with your relationships? How are you doing with your family? Whether you're all sequestered together still and on top of each other or spread out across the country and maybe feeling a little guilty that you're not communicating more, are you gaining an increased vision for relational health? Um, I hope so. We all need it. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating to me how relationships and specifically family relationships can be an absolute study in contrasts. I, I mean, how is it possible that the people that know you the best and love you the most can actually be some of the most difficult people to relate to. I mean, how can it happen that the people who would have your back and would defend you against the world can also send you into therapy sometimes? How can it be that the people that, that would do anything for you can actually sometimes be the very people that hold you back from being everything that you were created to be. Uh, th th there's a contributing factor to these dynamics, and I want to talk about that today. And I I'm going to call that factor familiar spirits. And rather than me explaining what I mean by familiar spirits, let's start with a scripture passage that perfectly illustrates this concept. And so if you would, go with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14, where it says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. 
and hang on just a second for a, just a quick theological timeout. When this says that an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him, that, that doesn't mean that God was personally inflicting uh, the spirit on Saul. What it means primarily is that as the Holy Spirit pulled back from Saul, other spirits rushed in to afflict him. Uh, verse 15, Saul's attendant said to him, see an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let us um, search out someone who can play the liar. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes upon you and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem, and this would be David, who knows how to play the lyre. He is brave. He is a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man. And the Lord is with him. <laughs> wow, what a description of David at this moment in David's life. Uh, at this point in David's life, David's the total package. He's, he's athlete and artist. He's warrior and poet. He's a, a, a fantastic communicator and he's super good looking. And on top of all of these attributes, he's also anointed. God is with him. The anointing makes everyone more attractive. And David is just the, 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 the total package here. He's a head turner. And I don't think the Bible's lying to us in this description. I think he really was all of these things. And when Saul's servants went out to find a worship leader to serve the king, that's how they saw David. And so holding that description of David, let's carry this into the next chapter, chapter 17, where Goliath and the Philistines have assaulted Israel and David goes to take some supplies to his three oldest brothers. David was the youngest of eight brothers. The oldest three were soldiers in Saul's army. So holding on to that picture of David from chapter 16, let's look at chapter 17, verse 13. It says, Jesse's three eldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the fighting men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out just as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting their war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and he ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. And I've always loved that phrase where it says, and David heard it. Goliath had been shouting the same thing for 40 days and 40 nights, but on this particular day, David heard the words, and that changed everything. In verse 26, David asks, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Verse 28. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and he asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are. I know how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. And if you read this out of the King James translation, he says, I know the naughtiness of your heart. And this is crazy. We just read the description of who David was. At this point in his life, he is gifted, he's brave, he's a warrior, he's the epitome of a rising star. But when he shows up at the battle lines, all his older brother can see is the annoying, pesky, naughty little brother. And that's what familiar spirits do. 
familiar family spirits kind of hold us back to earlier moments in our life. And so even though we've grown up and we've glowed up, we're still being viewed through the lens of who we were back then. And not only uh, do these familiar spirits try and hold us back to that moment in time, but, but they also try and get us to start acting like we did back then. Uh, familiar spirits are kind of like the grooves in the freeway when the traffic has worn this path. And if you get close enough, it sucks you back into place and it forces you to go. So not only did Eliab um, hold David back to that earlier picture of him, but when David got around him, he started acting like it. Now listen to the next verse, verse 29. David answers, now what have I done? Can I even speak? And so he, he almost sounds like the annoying pesky kid brother in this moment. We all have dynamics like this in our families. None of us is immune. Jesus wasn't immune. In fact, in John chapter 7, verse 2, it says, <clears throat> When the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. And it's so sad when the people who know us the best actually understand us the least. And you're vulnerable to this. Your family might be doing this to you. And you might be doing this to your family. And sometimes mindfulness is a breakthrough. Sometimes when we become mindful of a dynamic, that mindfulness can help us get free from the dynamic. So let, let me throw at you just two quick questions um, to raise mindfulness. So mindfulness question number one, are you viewing any of your family members through the lens of their yearbook photo? When, when David the warrior showed up to the battle lines, all Eliab could see was David's kindergarten picture. It's kind of like, um, you know how people will sometimes do the whole I knew them when thing with celebrities where someone who went to school with Dwayne Johnson will show the yearbook picture when he was awkward and he wasn't cool and this handsome and, and they'll post that picture. I knew him back then. Um, are we doing that to any of our family members? Are we holding them back to how we used to view them because of who they used to be? Um, David's a warrior, but I still see the annoying little kid that followed me around and wouldn't leave me alone. Now, th this is kind of a tough question to consider, but do you want your family to stay stuck in their yearbook photo? See, when a family member starts to grow and change and excel, it can actually shine a light on some of our own stagnation. When, when Eliab was terrified of Goliath with the rest of the Israelite warriors, and then David shows up and takes him out, it exposed the cowardice in Eliab, and that can be tough. So, so that's number one. Are you viewing any family members through the lens of their yearbook photo? Uh, mindfulness question number two, when you get around your family, do you start acting like your yearbook photo? See, one of the ways that we know that we're coming under the influence of these familiar spirits is when we get around those spirits and we revert back to our former ways of relating. Um, I know people who are godly and mature. They're inspiring. And yet when they get around their family, they just immediately slip back into this whiny, selfish, dysfunctional way of relating. And by the way, this is different from having a safe place to drop your guard. We all need to have a safe place where we can drop our guard and just be real. And I hope that's your family for you. But that's different from getting around family dynamics and immediately slipping back into the same old way that you always used to relate. So um, ask, ask your family these questions. Are, 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 we, are we holding each other back? Are we launching each other toward destiny? Or do we have a dynamic that keeps us stuck in any of those past ways of relating? If we want to cleanse our families from familiar spirits, we have to recognize the spirits. We have to reject those dynamics. And then we have to start looking at each other through a different grid. So I wanna give you a simple four-part grid that we can use to view each other in a new way. And if we can view each other through this grid, we can begin to dismantle some of the effects of these familiar spirits. And this grid, by the way, 
it, it can be applied to more than blood relatives. This applies to friendships. Um, if you're, if you judge me, if you evaluate me, I would love for you to do it through this grid. And this grid is made up of the four son of designations of Jesus. To understand Jesus, we have to know whose son he was. And that's true for you and me too. To understand who we are, we have to know whose daughter or whose son we are. And, and so the first son of designation is this. Jesus Christ, number one, was the carpenter's son. Jesus was the son of Mary and her husband, Joseph. He was the carpenter's son. In fact, that's what they called him um, in, in Matthew chapter 13, um, verse 55. It, they said, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all of his sisters with us? Jesus was the carpenter's son, and that meant something. Whatever family culture Joseph and Mary established affected Jesus. In fact, um, last Christmas, Pastor Jeff brought us a great message about what it might have been like to live in Joseph's home. As a human son, Jesus was influenced and shaped by his family, and we are too. Uh, my mom and dad had issues that your mom and dad didn't have. And conversely, my parents were awesome in areas where your parents struggled. Um, my dad was a cop, uh, and, and being a cop brought a certain dynamic into our relationship. Joseph was a carpenter, and being a carpenter brought a certain dynamic into that relationship. My dad came home at the end of long, stressful days. Joseph came home after physically grueling days, and for better or for worse, the strengths, the weaknesses, the issues of our families shaped us. What family dynamics shaped you and are still shaping you? Um, number one, Jesus was the carpenter's son. Uh, but number two, Jesus was also the son of man. So he was the carpenter's son specifically, but he was the son of man generally. Jesus was called the son of man 81 times in the New Testament. And so this means that he didn't just have the specific family cultural traits from Joseph and Mary, he also had the general traits of what it means to be human. Um, if you study my life, you'll find that I am the, 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 the result of both my family dynamics and my humanity. I blame my mom and my dad and my sister and my brothers for some of my issues. But I blame God for some of my other issues. See, I'm human, and you're human too. And by the way, uh, before you feel like you need to defend God from that statement of me blaming him, God knows that he made us human. God knows how he created us. In fact, over in uh, Psalm 103, verse um, 14, it says, For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. So thank God, Jesus knows what it means to be human. Jesus was the carpenter's son specifically. He was the son of man generally. But this is where the sermon gets good because number three, he wasn't just the carpenter's son. He wasn't just the son of man. Jesus was also the son of David. And that speaks to destiny. Uh, Jesus was the Jewish messianic hope. He was the prophesied offspring of David who would raise up the throne of David and rule over Israel. And of course, he would do that in ways that they would never have been able to comprehend. But he was the son of David nonetheless. And listen, you have a destiny too. And so do I. And we can't really understand each other fully until we view each other through that lens of destiny. Um, I, I might be selfish and annoying and too regimented in areas, but I am also called to serve and lead and be a pastor. And that's as much a part of who I am as those more flawed parts are. My brother Cheyenne had some really annoying personality traits when we were kids. And if I only view him through the grid of the son of man, I'll conclude that, man, he drives me crazy in this area. 
But, but when I view him through the grid of the son of David, when I look at him through the lens of destiny and I realize, wow, he, he, was, he was created to be an artist and a performer and an entertainer, suddenly those other aspects make perfect sense. Uh, some of the personality traits that did not serve me well in high school are exactly what I needed to be a good pastor today. Um, Amber thinks too much. Maddie is on the go too much. And if I only view them as, as um, daughters of man, if I only view them as human daughters, that can be irritating. But if I view them through the, the lens of being daughters of David, uh, of being daughters of destiny, suddenly everything changes and I realize, wow, Amber's going to be a brilliant thinking counselor and Madeline's going to be magnetic in relating with people. So let's not judge our families just through the lens of our own family or their humanity. Let's judge them through the lens of destiny. And then finally, we all know that Jesus most powerful son of designation was not the carpenter's son or the son of man or even the son of David, but we all know that Jesus was also the son of God. And in Jesus' case, that speaks to his divinity. In our case, that speaks to what we call the imago Dei or the image of God inside us. Uh, Jessica is not just a last born daughter redhead which has implications in all its own. Uh, Jessica's not just a sanguine phlegmatic temperament with mercy exhorter spiritual gifts and an ENFJ Myers-Briggs handle and a type two Enneagram um, listing. She's all of those things and all of those son of designations help me understand her. But more important than any of that is this daughter of God designation. She's also a living, breathing temple of the spirit of the living God. God resides in her. Um, C.S. Lewis was so brilliant in his understanding um, with all of this and, and his view of the, the weight of glory in us as humans. And he famously said that you and I have never met a mere mortal. Um, viewing each other through these different grids helps us understand who we are today and where we're going tomorrow. Um, the carpenter's son, the son of, of man, that helps you know why you are where you are today, but being the child of David or the child of God lets you know where he's taking you tomorrow. You are more than meets the eye. And so is your family. So can we, can, can, can we um, start thinking about this? Can we absorb this into the way we think and relate? And, and can we begin to view our family members differently? Can we start pushing back against the influence of these familiar spirits that would either trap us in a certain time or get us relating like we did in a certain place. And you know what I love about all of this is that Jesus' brothers, his natural brothers, did eventually believe. Those same brothers who missed him completely. They didn't even have a clue about his real calling. They thought he was trying to become famous. He was trying for anything other than that. These same brothers that didn't know him, didn't get it, didn't believe, eventually came to the place where they realized, wow, he's not just the carpenter's son like we are. He's not just human like we are. He really is the son of David. He really is the son of God come into the world to save us and rescue us from the inside out. In fact, you have two books in your Bible, the books of James and Jude, were both written by these natural brothers who eventually came to believe that Jesus really was who he said he was. So let's set our families free and let's demand our own freedom. You are more than your past. You are more than your upbringing. It shaped you, but it doesn't ultimately define you. You are more than you appear in this moment, but we have to respond in this moment to step more fully into destiny, to manifest more fully that Imago Dei on the inside of us. Let's follow the lead of the Son of God, the Son of David, in becoming who we were created to be. So Lord Jesus Christ, today we just look to you and thank you for who you are. Thank you for who you have made us and who you are calling us to be. Right now, each one of us 
figuratively, but with every bit of our being, we open our heart and our soul to you. And we ask you to flood us and wash us and fill us to a degree that we have never known before. Would you break the chains of familiar spirits? Would you bind the influences that want to lock us in place or shift us back to past ways of relating? And would you give us the grace to set people free? Would you let us grow up and glow up and become everything that we were destined for? Let us begin looking more and more and more like our father David, like our father God. Lord, we need you. We want you. We surrender the steering wheel of our life to you. And Jesus, lead us where you want us to go. Help us to follow you and know you and experience you. Free us from yesterday. Wash us from mistakes. Give us glorious victories and conquests and breakthroughs in the future. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So let's go love each other, serve each other, and free each other to be who we were created to be. God bless you. Love you. Have a great week.